So the death toll stands at 18, with more than 1,500 people hospitalised so far. Germany is experiencing its deadliest bacterial outbreak linked to food. Uh, the problem has spread, of course, to other countries in Europe. And although raw vegetables are being blamed, there's no certainty yet about the exact source. So shortly we'll speak to a couple of experts who will outline the risk for us in this country. But first, Jill Higgins looks at how Germany is responding. Is it the curse of the cucumber? the scourge of the salad. According to this New Zealander living in Germany, the authorities still aren't sure. They just don't know. It's not the Spanish cucumbers that it was meant to be. They keep saying it's found it in a, in a big supermarket in, in Hamburg, and then they say, no, it's not. They've actually got no idea, and they're trying to keep us calm. With hundreds in hospital and at least 17 deaths, it's the worst E. coli outbreak ever. As Paul durrant Wedekind had kids, he's glad to see precautions are being taken. The school canteens are not doing salads anymore. And people are taking similar measures themselves. I had a meal out the other night and I didn't eat uh, any, any uh, lettuce or uh, tomatoes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's all you can do. We're still not panicking because we've had so many warnings over here. You have the uh, mad cow disease and then you have the sheep. It happens quite a lot over here. In the past, undercooked meat's been blamed for spreading dangerous strains of the bacterium E. coli, but now other sources are seen as an equal risk. Drinking unpasteurized milk or untreated water and eating raw vegetables, which still appears to be the root of the problem in Germany. It's a bit of a shame, really. What do you eat? You know, you want to eat healthy and all these people that have been, been dying are people that have, lot, have eaten a lot of raw vegetables. That's what they've said, too. So that's the only thing they can conclude. Everyone that's died eats lots of raw vegetables. It may be the vegetables were irrigated with unclean water or infected with contaminated compost. Experts say the bacteria then get inside the actual cells of the vegetables. But basic hygiene is still being advised. Wash your hands more. And uh, a friend of mine who works as a biologist said you should wash your vegetables with soap. Here we import very few vegetables from Europe. And there's only ever been one death from E. coli. But the risk is always present. So events in Europe are clearly food for thought. Indeed, Jill Higgins with the German reaction. So do the experts actually know what we're dealing with and should we be at all worried given we're on the other side of the world? Joining us now is the microbiologist Dr Susie Wiles and in Dunedin Professor Kurt Krauss from the Webster Centre for Infectious Diseases. Evening to both of you. Susie, I'll start with you. This, this washing of soap and rinsing your vegetables, I mean, is that sensible advice or not? I'm not sure about soap. Definitely rinsing them is a good idea, but I think the important thing to say is that it doesn't get rid of all the bacteria. Because the bacteria is inside. If they have got inside, which they certainly have done um, in lab tests and a few um, trials in the field as well. What do we know? Is it actually the vegetables or we wouldn't have a clue? So I guess epidemiologists are, are trying to find the source. Um, and more, the most recent outbreaks have been associated with things like leafy vegetables. So it's, it's certainly a possibility, um, quite a high possibility. That because it's get. one of the great dangerous things, what we've seen this week. I mean, they have absolutely munted the entire fruit and vegetable industry it's of Spain. Yes, and they, amazing. They, we still actually don't know if it was the fruit and vegetables. Yeah, as I say, I th it's probably likely. Um, and uh, there's just people now rushing to try and find out the source. Definitely. Kurt, what do you make of it as far as the spread is concerned? What are you looking at over the next few days? What should happen, do you think? Well, the important thing will be to see uh, what happens with the primary cases. So there's been about 1,600 primary cases. And normally the incubation period for this kind of illness is about three to five days. And then things should be settling down now. So if the infections settle down and then diminish, then the outbreak is going to be a lot like a typical E. coli outbreak. On the other hand, if the organism is highly contagious and secondary uh, infections occur, then that'll be, that'll be a little bit worrisome because it might imply that this bug is a bit more contagious than the typical E. coli. Because E. coli breaks out all the time, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. The E. coli is one of the most common causes of foodborne illness worldwide. So that, that's not unusual at all. I guess the aspects that are unusual about this are the large numbers and then the fact that a large number of people have this dangerous syndrome that people are talking about, the hemolytic uremic syndrome, it's unusual to have so many people have that. I think it's about 25% of the infections have developed hemolytic uremic syndrome. That's a little bit unusual because it's in adults and it's also in adult women. Yes. And as, uh, as Dr. Wells mentioned, that could well be because women eat or are eating more leafy vegetables. But we, so that's, but we that's don't unusual. know for sure, though. 
Oh, you mean we, we don't know for sure. sure they Women, eat more the leaky liver, vegetables, all those sort of ind individual problems that we're seeing at the moment. We don't know that for sure. Yeah, right. Absolutely, that's all being worked out, and it does take a bit of time to source these outbreaks. It's, it's common to have the initial uh, offender be cleared and then find, it, find out what the real source is a, a few days or weeks hence. What would you... Sorry, Caroline, you... We certainly... We do know that it's, it is women primarily who are, who are getting it. There's more women than, than men who are getting it. And we do know also that the, there are more... Um, the women are in their sort of 20s to, to 40s. And that's very unusual because normally this hemolytic uremic syndrome is in the elderly or in children. So we do know those kinds of things. And now finding out, so what is it about this bacterium that's different from normal um, is sort of what's fascinating for me as a microbiologist because we know now that there are things... It does it bother you? It doesn't seem to be responding to antibiotics? Um, I can't really answer that um, as I don't really know much about how you would um, treat these things normally because I'm not really a clinician. Okay, so, what do, what do you yeah. say? Does it bother you about the antibiotic lack of reaction? Well, it, interestingly, the, the primary way to treat this kind of syndrome is not antibiotics. It's actually supportive measures, hydration. In the case of the hemolytic uremic syndrome, you might uh, add dialysis if a person needed dialysis. But the use of antibiotics in this particular kind of bacteria is actually a little bit controversial. Some studies would say that you should avoid antibiotics. Other studies would say you can use them. In general, the infection clears itself without antibiotics, though. Uh, it, it is unusual that this degree of antibiotic resistance in the E. coli, just in general, because it's kind of typical for what we're seeing around the world, that bugs are getting more resistant and becoming uh, more difficult to treat. But this particular syndrome, antibiotics aren't key. What are you thinking human to human and the chances of it being passed on? So at the moment, that's sort of quite unlikely, and you'd, you'd need to have really quite bad hygienic practices to spread it. Um, because it's spread through the feces, so if you... So if I was travelling to Germany, I don't worry about the Germans, I worry about eating vegetables, perhaps? Yes. OK, and yes. people who are coming back from Europe, we don't need to panic in this part of the country. No, absolutely. So we could well see some cases in, in, uh, in New Zealand. If we have some people who've been travelling in Germany and they come back home and they're, they're um, not having diarrhoea while they're on the plane, because then they would be sort of intercepted, but if they got their diarrhoea when they got here, then presented at the hospital, you know, there's, you're unlikely to catch it from them, as I say, unless you were very, very unhygienic. So making sure that you wash your hands, after you've been to the toilet, those kinds of things are really important. So what happens, Kurt, if in a couple of days and the incubation period works us through and it gets worse and there are more outbreaks and there's still no antibiotics and people are still getting sick and they're still dying and we still don't know where it comes from? What happens then? Well, if, if you have a um, sort of a broader range of outbreak, then public health measures would be brought to bear. People with illnesses would, would be isolated in order to avoid uh, spreading to other people. And as Sushi mentioned, it's actually pretty difficult in order to, to pass this because it's, it's passed really by the fecal oral route. And so as long as you're not in, ingesting E. coli, you're not going to get it. You can't get it, for example, from the air. It has to be direct ingestion of the bugs. And that's relatively easy to control. So I, I don't envision that, that this will happen. And if we do get some secondary cases, they're almost uh, undoubtedly going to be controllable through the use of hygienic practices and isolating people who are ill. Because I'm so hesitant to start using words like bird flu, swine flu, pandemic, World Health Organization and all that stuff we've gone through before. Are we, are we going down that track or not? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a completely different thing because influenza can be th spread by coughing and th through uh, sneezing and coughing and this is not spread that way at all. Okay, so we shouldn't be overly worried in this part of the world, you don't think? I think the important thing is for us to find out where this has come yeah. from. Because if it is something like infection of, um, of, of the vegetables and things, then it's how did they get infected? And the farming practices, you know, throughout the world would have to take note of, wh of what happened okay. then and whether... Could be cows, irrigation, fertiliser, yeah, all, all right, we'll watch them. I appreciate your time. Susie Wiles and uh, Kurt, appreciate your time as well. All right,